fish farms. They can't last that long without harvesting a product. So they came to us and said, how can you speed up the growth of a walleye? Right? Well, we're a little short on magic, so we had to apply some basic biology to it. And what we found was is that if you take a walleye and you breed it with its cousin, the sauger, you get a fish which naturally occurs in Wisconsin called the saugai. Okay? Now that's a horrible marketing name. I don't know anybody who would go to a restaurant and say, give me the saugai. <laughs> right? So you'll tell, we call them hybrid walleye. It's a sweeter little name. <laughs> right? And essentially what we did is we found that if we breed those two together and then raise them indoors in tanks, we can accelerate their growth so we can get them from an egg all the way up to essentially a marketable fish in one year. Okay? So the way we show it is, is that in the comes, comes around March, we have an egg. By the time June comes around, we have them that big. By the time December to February comes around, we have them that big. And shortly after that, they look a little bit like that. <laughs> right? So this is one of the areas where a company came to us and said, make this happen because I need it to be a viable industry. And we've had some great successes with it. Okay? And we can do that, like I said, we try to do this with many different species of fish. Some we succeed, some we go back into development again. All right? Now, I mentioned this already. The other thing that we do is, is we have an outreach program where we start to share information about aquaculture with the public, try to answer some of those concerns people have, um, and also to promote you know, a lot of farm-raised fish. Well, the Monterey Bay Aquarium puts out an annual seafood watch. And they place farm-raised fish into categories of your best choice, a good alternative, or those to avoid. And what you'll notice if you go down this list over here on the best choices is where most of the farmed fish actually show up. So the Monterey Bay Aquarium knows that farm-raised fish are your safer choices to eat compared to the wild fish that are out there. Right? Some of the farmed ones that, again, that pop up throughout here are either imported from other countries Right? Or we, excuse me, we go back to that Atlantic salmon again, where they're very concerned about pollution taking place since they're raised in those net pens. All right, just to shift gears a little bit, Chris also mentioned that the university and the college has gotten into the field of aquaponics. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that as well. I kind of view aquaponics as what I call a refined branch of aquaculture. Okay. And the reason I say that is, is that aquaponics is integrating into one system farming fish and then farming plants, but farming the plants in water with no soil, excuse me, with no soil. Okay? I say it's refined because from an aquaculture perspective, the plants are really playing the role of a filter. Okay? They're uptaking nutrients produced by the fish and purifying the water that goes back to the fish again. Okay? So that's kind of the view of it. On the other hand, if you ask an aquaponics producer, how do you view aquaponics, they usually kind of lean more a little bit on the hydroponic side of it and say, well, I like that definition, except I produce 10 times the number of plants than I do fish. So am I really a fish farmer or am I a plant grower who just throws some fish into the equation? Okay? So why do this? And you can see a little bit here. You're raising your fish in tanks. Then the water goes to the plants which float in the water. They remove the nutrients and then the water comes back cleaner to the fish. Why do this? Well, for one, it's sustainable and natural. It's a high degree of water conservation. It is also just an exchange. I mean, you're feeding the fish, but then it's just waste that's fertilizing the plants. And it's a natural form of waste. It's not a bottle of mixed up inorganic chemicals being dumped into it. It's highly efficient. You can regulate to a fine degree the growth of your fish, which will dictate the growth of your plants in the system. It also, as I said already, is a conservative use of resource, water, as well as space and labor. You'll notice everything is tightly packed here into a greenhouse to actually accomplish it. It's free of pesticides, herbicides, and chemical fertilizers. This is one area people don't realize so much, and that is you're raising crops, you're raising lettuce, you're raising tomatoes, cucumbers. In a typical agricultural field, they'll spread lots and lots of different pesticides on them. Here you can't because if you sprayed pesticides on the plants, they would be okay, the bugs would get off of them, but you'd watch as all your fish float up to the surface into the fish tank because <laughs> it will have killed all the fish. So in aquaponics, you cannot apply those pesticides and herbicides to those systems because it'll kill the fish. 
right? So instead you have to find alternative means which most of the time are natural means. In other words, if you see bugs on your plants, go out there and start picking them off. <laughs> That's really the way they accomplish a lot of it. All right? People really like it too because you produce both an animal protein in terms of the fish as well as a vegetable crop. And if you produce it in a system like a greenhouse, you actually can produce this food 365 days of the year. I think one of the greatest days last winter, and we were just discussing about what the weather outside predicts for this winter, but I think it was during one of the polar vortexes last winter, I actually went to one of the aquaponics greenhouses, and it was negative 25 outside, we had the, all that Howard crusty snow, they opened the door and I walked in, and it was a tropical environment. <laughs> and I actually said to the owner, I'm just pulling up a lounge chair, sitting down with a good book, leave me alone and come back in a couple hours. <laughs> it really lifted my spirits, I know. Well, it's also on their end, producing food throughout the year right here in Wisconsin. Right? And it's not imported food, it's made right in the backyard. Now how aquaponics done, is done really differs based upon people's experiences and what their goals are. Right? There are three main types of production systems. One is referred to as the nutrient film technique, which I highlight here. Think about this in which the water comes from the fish, so it's full of fish waste or manure, and then it basically goes over to what are essentially large gutters. And the plants are stuck into these holes in the top of the gutter, but here and here comes that nutrient-rich rich water. It flows through the gutter and comes out on the other side. And as it passes by, the plants absorb the nutrients from the water and purify it. Okay? It's a nice method. A couple of drawbacks to it is that it takes up a lot of space in a greenhouse. So you cut down on the amount of production of plants. And the other is, is because fish produce waste that is both liquid and solid, the solid waste has a tendency to clog these pipes. So it has a higher degree of maintenance associated with it. Another is what's referred to as media beds. Right? Now what these are are just large troughs, and they're filled with basically inactive particles. What is that? In this case, it's little balls of clay. Or it could be little beads of plastic. Okay? Anything that won't dissolve in water is what they fill these media beds with. There's no soil in there. Okay? They're not dissolving like dirt does. They're basically, their role is to hold on to the roots of the plants, right? So media bed culture is widely used in aquaponics when you're raising a plant that needs to grow upright. So things such as tomatoes or cucumbers or melons, in this case carrots, anything that needs to firmly plant its roots and then grow, they use media beds for. But the same principle applies. You can see the pipe right here, it's spraying out fertilized water, nutrient-rich water from the fish. It then drains, this has a slope to it, so it all comes down to the bottom end, and then the water is collected and brought back to the fish again, with the plants removing the nutrients along the way. And then the last, which is probably the most popular, is what's referred to as raft or deep water culture. Right? Now don't let the name kind of fool you. Deep water, again, see how deep the water is? It's two feet. Right? Compared to nutrient film technique where it's a half an inch, this is deep water. Okay? But what this is, is as you can see here, it's these large troughs filled with water and the plants are basically shoved into something that floats. Most of the time some type of foam board. Okay? And then the plants essentially, the young ones are planted down here and as they grow these boards are pushed up further and further until you get up to the far end here where you have a head of lettuce ready for harvest. Right? The idea being is, as you can see in some of the pictures, their roots are floating down here in the water, absorbing up all the nutrients, again recycling fresher water back to the fish. Okay? The other thing you'll notice about it is, is what's in the picture? Lettuce. Lots of different lettuce varieties. Raft culture is really good for low ground type of plants, such as lettuce. Okay? If you were to put a tomato plant in there and it grows up, what do you think is going to happen? Oh. Use your hand there to show it. It's going to flip over at some point, and then you lost everything. So they use raft culture for the low form type of plants because they won't flip the foam boards over. Right? But it is highly efficient, and that is that a typical aquaponics grower can plant a seed of lettuce and six weeks later harvest a head of lettuce. Okay? Now part of that is the fact they're growing it in a greenhouse that's nice and warm, Right? But the other is, is that it's getting a constant supply of sunlight, water, and nutrients, the three things that plants love. Right? And it's getting it 24 hours a day. So this is very popular, again, for that. And the other is, is that turnaround time. People like to grow lettuce because you can have a crop in six weeks. 
Right, a tomato plant's probably going to take you a couple of months because first the plant's got to grow, then it's got to flower, and then it's got to produce tomatoes, and then they have to ripen. So it takes a little longer for those. Right, this is one of the slides, this one and the next one that I like to show when people are kind of learning about aquaponics, is they say, well, that sounds easy. I'm going to do it. Keep in mind that aquaponics is actually a compromise. Okay? What they don't realize is that you're actually growing three crops. You've got the fish, you've got the plants, but you're also growing bacteria. Okay? But it's beneficial bacteria, not contagious or pathogenic bacteria. Right? We know about the fish. You're growing fish in the system. They have temperatures and a pH range that they like, and you're feeding them the fish food. They digest it, they process it, and they produce some waste. That waste enters the water. The water then actually flows to the bacteria. And there's a prime reason for that. Fish produce most of their waste in the form of ammonia. Okay? Ammonia is also highly toxic to fish. So if they just stayed in their own water, it would kill them. Also, plants don't like ammonia necessarily as the most immediate source of things such as nitrogen that they need. So what is here is that there's usually a, 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 a tub or a barrel that has ba the bacteria in it. And what you're providing there is nitrifying bacteria that convert the ammonia to nitrite and then nitrate. Why is that beneficial? Number one, nitrate is not very toxic to fish. So they're fine in the water. The other fact is, is that the nitrate is what the plants like to really take up as their nutrient source. So the bacteria play that role. From there, then, the nutrient water goes to the plants, where they uptake the nutrients that they need, returning the water to the fish. So why is it a compromise? Well, I kind of put the ranges up there. The temperature and pH ranges for the fish, the bacteria, and the plants don't necessarily directly overlap. Some of them do a little bit, but not all three. So aquaponics is not really raising your fish, your plants, and your bacteria under optimum conditions. You're actually trying to find a balance. And the balance that's recommended is to raise them in a temperature range of about 70 to 80 degrees at a pH of about 7. Is that ideal for everybody? No. Will everybody survive? Yes. Right? But it also means that you're probably not getting the optimum or the most rapid growth of your fish and plants in the system. You're getting near optimum, but not actually at that level. And that's a core thing to remember about aquaponics, because people kind of sometimes view it and say, well, this is the, the perfect match. Right here, I'm going to get the best growth. But you're going to get good growth, very good growth, maybe not the best growth. Right? The other is this, and that is, is that some people say, well, why does it work? How can you grow a plant and a fish? Right? Well, I took the label off of a bag of fish food and basically listed the main ingredients in it. And then I went into one of the botany books they have, and I picked out well, one of the, some of the main nutrients that plants need. And I think this is one of the answers to that question, is that if you go through it, there's about a 70% overlap in what fish need and plants need. And all you're doing really is recycling that in the system. Okay? What doesn't match up is, is that fish need a little dose of cobalt, selenium, and iodine, and plants need some boron, molybdenum, and sulfur. But all of those six are really micronutrients. So it's relatively easy just to tweak the system a little and add those small amounts of micronutrients that they might need. Okay? So really, there's a great model here for this kind of like synergistic growth of plants and fish. They need similar things. And this is one of the reasons why aquaponics works. All right, a little bit about the industries. People often ask me, well, is there really an aquaponics industry? All right, if I want to get into this for farming, Who's doing it? Right? Well, fortunately, just in 2014, the first survey of aquaponics was done in the US. Now, it shows you the dots, and some of the larger dots basically mean there's more farms in a particular area. One of the things that came out was is that they found there are over 800 aquaponics farms in the US. So there is an industry that's out there. Okay? Many of them are small. Okay? So they don't see these large industrial aquaponic businesses. But the other thing is, is that I think that's an underestimate. They used a very nicely worded method, and they said they used for their survey an email chain sampling method. Right? Does that ring a bell with any email chain? Those are mostly caught by spam filters nowadays. Or if you got one, wouldn't you just delete it? So I think actually a lot of their surveys just got deleted by people, even if they were in aquaponics, because it was just another chain letter that came along. So I have a feeling that it's actually grossly underestimated the size of the industry in the US, 
But for most people, when they see this map, they go, wow, that's actually a lot of fish or a lot of aquaponic farms. So it's a starting point. Okay? Why are people getting involved? Well, these were the three items that they were listed in the survey as the top reasons. Food security and food quality. You know where your food's coming from. Another is, is locally grown. Aquaponic businesses are popping up, in this case, literally in the backyard of everybody, including my own house, actually. Our neighbor's doing it. <laughs> right? And then the last is, is that you get limited fresh water that actually has to be recycled in these systems. Okay, so Chris had mentioned this, and that is UWSP is in the process of working with Nelson and Pate Incorporated to build the nation's first aquaponics innovation center. We hope to have it online and operational come 2015. And then again, it's going to work on a similar model to our aquaculture facility, and that is we're going to ask the industry, what questions do you have? And let's start answering them and getting the technology transferred back to the farms. Right? These are some of the students that have been involved in courses and projects at the facilities, uh, that in aquaponic industries, I should say, in the state. And we're leading the nation, really, in college aquaponics education. Right? There was a little story that ran two years ago. We actually launched the nation's first college aquaponics course. Right? We're offering again uh, starting in January. Right? The turnout has just been phenomenal. I think the first year we had 24 students. The second year we had 39. And the last year we had 54. So that number is just growing exponentially as people want an education on how to run these systems. Right? So where do we see change happening in the next few years? Well, I mentioned already, and that is, is that aquaculture really as an agriculture industry is in its infancy. Okay? It's going to adapt, it's going to have to change if it wants to become part of U.S. agriculture. Another is domestication. We have to try more fish, we have to try more plants in aquaponics. We have to see what works and what doesn't work. Right? I talked about this already. We need to farm down the food chain. Stop eating those salmon fillets or those tuna steaks and start eating more things like tilapia, more things like bluegill even. And then I think there's going to be a tendency to head towards water recycle systems. Right? You just have to look at the huge drought they have in California right now and realize that that's probably going to become more commonplace. So recycling water is going to be really, really important. So then the last question I'll just leave you with is, is for this industry to develop, it's going to have to answer that question. And that is, is how is aquaculture and aquaponics going to grow and fit in U.S. agriculture? And how is it going to do so so that it's sustainable, so that it's conservation, and so that it meets the social requirements that we apply to it? So how are we going to make that green industry become a blue revolution? So thank you for your time. Part of the revolution, the other part is the need for the food to process. 